Good morning, everyone. It's Yvonne Ashton here, Director of Marketing at Maya Wholesale Florist, and I want to welcome you to our April 16th Mornings with Maya show. Today is always going to be a good day because we're answering your flower questions live with Dave and Shelly. Super, super excited, guys. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to come on in. And while we're doing that, please say hello in the comments. Let us know where you're from. I see Penny and Huntress Florals. You guys are always here. Thank you for being amazing. And uh, everyone else, say hi. Um, I'm just going to go through, like, if you are new to the show, um, I just want to let you know that we will be posting the replay on our blog in the next couple of days. It will also be up on YouTube. And then we also create an amazing podcast for you guys to listen to. So that way you can design or work out or whatever you need to do during the day, but still get all of this really yummy information that we share with you in our shows. Super, super excited. Good morning, RSVP Floral Design. Hello, hello. Um, okay, so that's the replay. I also get questions about when they can watch the replay. And just so you guys know, on Facebook Live, the replay is available immediately. So as soon as I hang up, I think it takes like, a few minutes for it to process and then it's good to go. So you guys can watch it as soon as the show is over. Sound good? Um, I also have Desi in the control room. Say good morning, Desi. How are you? I have Dave and, Je um, Dave and Shelly joining me. I almost said um, Jelly, <laughs> like Dave with a J and then Shelly. <laughs> Maybe we need to come up with a name for, with, for you guys. That would be fun, right? Um, all right, and then also while we are letting everyone come on in and join us for today's show, oh, I can see my umbrella. Hold on. Woo, there we go. I can see a whole bunch of things. That's okay, though. Uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that this amazing video and podcast is brought to you by Mayish Wholesale, our Mayish Design Star Flower Workshop Tour. And we have three more dates left, guys. The Nashville tickets are starting to go. Um, so if you are thinking about going to Nashville, make sure you grab your seat uh, within the next week because I have a feeling this is going to sell out. So be sure you grab it. It's May 20th and 21st, so a little bit more than a month away. It's going to be uh, all levels class, and it's going to be amazing. Sean Strong is awesome, um, and you're going to love him. So if you wanted some hands-on, you wanted a way to beef up your portfolio and get new images for your website and social media and work on your skills and play with amazing, beautiful, because we do like, we bring the best of the best for that season. So if you want to play with the best of the best flowers that maybe you don't get to play with all the time, um, this is the thing for you. Uh, also, we have our master class in Austin in August, and then another all levels class that we finish up the tour with in Columbus in November. So we're going to post that link for you guys. Be sure you check it out. And also wanted to let you know, we are still working on our 2020 international workshop. We are planning one. I don't have all of the details or pricing or anything, but if you want to be one of the first people to know about this amazing experience that we haven't completely put together yet, but I know it will be amazing, make sure that you fill out the form that is on the link that we're posting now. This is our link for the keto workshop, which is over with. We already did it, if you haven't heard, and it turned out amazing. I mean, people were crying happy tears because it was that amazing. Um, so we want to repeat that, but we're going to go to a different country. And it's going to be, I know it will be really, really exciting. Um, I'm already even in talks with a designer and I know another one that wants to come. And then we just have one more that we're going to line up. So we're going to, again, I think, try to bring three designers again. Um, and so it's going to be pretty cool. So fill out that that form so that way you can be in the second group that is going to be notified because what is going to happen is I'm going to notify all of our past students that had gone to our first international workshop and then I will let everyone know that is on the waiting list um, for the next international and then I will go live so I'm going to give everyone an opportunity who really wants to go first dibs so I just need to know who that is all right guys Okay, so I also wanted to make sure before we get started that you mark your calendars for May 21st um, after Mother's Day. That will be our next regular show. I'm hoping to get maybe a guest early in May, um, but I don't have that quite together. And I don't know, do you guys want to do that right before Mother's Day? Let me know, because <laughs> I don't know. Is that too much? 
I'm not sure. So maybe we'll just do one show this month. But, um, you know, let me know if you guys want to do something. I'll see if, what I can figure out. I just don't want to overwhelm people or do something great that someone is going to miss, you know, and then I would hate that. All right. So let me bring on Dave and Shelly and then we'll get started, guys. And good morning. Good morning, good morning. Dave. Good morning, Shelly. Hi. Oh, and I need to say good morning to Christine um, from Pennsylvania, Poppy OA from LA. We have Elizabeth watching from Texas. Yeah, uh, Texas. Yeah, she says, can't wait to start using y'all, which I love. I love using the word y'all, even though I'm technically don't don't really say it, but I like to write it. <laughs> um, Sarah from Washington, Walla Walla. That's a very Hi. fun city, Walla Walla. Jasmine from Tucson, Erica from Charlotte. Good morning, guys. Sandy and Tracy. I love all our viewers. Hi, guys. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And then also, before we get started, I wanted to let you guys know that Dave, we have you guys heard that we're opening up in Seattle? I know Dave and Shelly has, but everyone else that's watching. Uh, yeah, we're going to be opening in Seattle and Dave is going to be moving to Seattle, um, so, which means he's going to be really, really busy doing Seattle stuff. <laughs> I'm getting me like going that. over there. Yeah. So, you know, with that said, that means we're not sure how often Dave is going to be joining us on the show. It might be his last one. Maybe I can sneak in a couple before we open. We will see. But Dave, I just wanted to say thank you for everything that you've contributed so far to Mornings with Mayish. We all love you and just want to wish you the best of luck in Seattle. Uh, thanks, guys. It's It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, of course. So what kind of pretties do you guys have to show us today? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> <laughs> no, you go first, Shelly. Go ahead. <laughs> We're all excited. Okay. Um, I have to show you guys um, this really pretty little flower that we got in today. I'm going to take out this packaging here. It's called Canterbury Bells. Put it up here. No, is that no Cathedral Bells? Sorry, wrong name. We have um, been getting the vine too. They're just really pretty. They're a little stinky though. Just saying. Thanks, Molly. How big are they? It's hard to um, see. Okay. I like that. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty, really pretty kind of lavendery, purple and green. Interesting. And we've been getting the vine too. And you can see some of the pods of these flowers popping mm -hmm. out on the vine. That's one. Those are amazing. Um, local lilac. Woo! I'm just burying my face in it. Oh, I love lilac. So we've been getting our lilac from our local grower. Um, it's spring, so we're finally seeing a lot of pretty spring flowers. I showed you guys um, tulips last time, but there's some really beautiful colors. This lavender tulips. I think I have a purpley. Oh, and we're getting also the Washington field tulips, which are really nice and strong and inexpensive. We have some inexpensive flowers here that are two at <laughs> <laughs> They're good. Uh, this is a real, I'm in the lavender theme, as you can tell. These are lavender butterfly ranunculus. They're kind of a mauve color and they're really pretty. So pretty. That color. And one more, just because we're about to hit peony season, we're getting some gorgeous peonies now, finally. Woo! They're really pretty, so yay! Lots of pretty stuff. This is the best time of year for for um, really luscious, juicy, nice flowers. So beautiful, <laughs> yes. Love springtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, lo <clears throat> I love the spring also. I uh, grabbed a bunch of Queensland tulips, and these are the that. funky, frilly ones. Nice. Uh, they have the double petals in them. Love the textures. I didn't pull a whole lot of stuff, but I did focus on spring today. This is a double daffodil that's grown wow. in California. So it's called pretty. the Yosemite. So yeah, they're really fragrant too. Love the fragrant flowers. This is a flower native to um, Peru, but it's been grown in California. This is called Skilla. <laughs> and you really only see it this time of year. Fun little pop of purple, wow. funky texture. 
very funky. And last but not least, I have some Italian poppies. And I think Shelly showed these last week, but they're just so pretty right now. I had to They're show you huge. How big these things are. They're humongo. Yeah. Beautiful. They're both big boys. So love them. Love them <laughs> too. That's great. Thanks, guys. And also, we're going to be posting the link for our new Flower 411 straight from our purchasing department so that way you guys can see what is going on in the world of flowers and what's coming in and what's new and what might be hard to get and what might be hard, really, really expensive. Um, it's a nice little summary from them. You know, obviously, it's not all encompassing, but we like it. It hits all the, the, big, the big topics. So check that out. Of course, after we're done with the show, please. <laughs> okay, so on to our first question. It is all about fritillaria and how to process it. Why did that come out weird? I can't talk today. I'm very sorry about that. How to process and handle fritillaria. There we yeah. go. Fritillarias are cool. There's a bunch of varieties that are available right now imported from Holland. Um, they are bulb flowers, so hydrating them in a floral food intended for bulb flowers will extend their vase life. For the shorter and delicate varieties, use a shallow amount of hydrating solution so that stems aren't deeply plunged in there. This will help keep bacteria levels low, which as we know, will extend flower life. Very good. Um, I am have a video from that we did with David Dolson. I don't know when, I don't know, probably a couple years ago. Um, so we'll, I'm gonna grab the link for that and we'll post that in the comments for you guys and um, check that out when, of course, after we're done with the show. So he goes over a lot of the fritillaria. He talks about kind of the names and things like that. And I don't recall if he talks about the Karen handling part, but it's a it's a good video. So check it out. Um. All right, guys, the next question is from Barbara and she wants to know, is it better for hydrangea to have all the leaves stripped for longevity? We always get lots of hydrangea questions. <laughs> we need to just do one show on hydrangea one time. They right? flowers. They're so finicky. Yeah. So there are two schools of thought on this. Number one says removing all the leaves exposes the vascular system and that can cause uh, excess transpiration or possible air bubbles to enter that could block the hydration process. The opposing number two says that the leaves compete with the flower heads for water. In Phoenix, we, we vase tested them both ways and found that with the foliage or not, the vase life was not significantly affected by keeping or removing the foliage. Additionally, the vases that we tested here with floral food lasted three to five days longer than those that were treated with plain water. So use your flower food, guys. Good to know. Shelly, what do you think? My preferred method is always to strip the leaves. Um, if you are not um, tugging or pulling on the stem, you're not going to damage it. You just want to cut the leaves. You're not trying to rip them off the stem. Also, it depends on how long you're using them. If you're using or cutting hydrangeas short, you definitely don't want the leaves on because if they're in water, you don't want the leaves in water. They do better when they're shorter. Um, Essentially, like Dave was saying, a Fleming a flower head, it's uh, the leaves help draw up water, but too many leaves can also put water in the leaves and not the flower. And since hydrangeas struggle with drinking sometimes, it, it also depends on the variety. Mostly it's the, har the hardiest ones seem to be white, uh, light blue, the green, and antique varieties. The ones that typically people have the worst trouble with are like pink, the purple, the more Dutch varieties, they're, anti they're a little softer flower, and so it's not as hardy. So basically, you always want to try to keep the foliage off of any of those flowers. And if you're leaving them short, they're going to drink better because the stem's shorter. So you want to try to do that. Very good. You can soak the heads, too. That's another way to keep. We've talked about that before. Soaking the head helps them draw up water. Yeah, love it. Good. Um, just going back, you guys showed both showed some tulips and Bradley is watching. Hi, Brad. How are you? And he has a spray tip. I don't know if you guys know. And if you don't know, Brad, he works for Design Master and he's amazing. His whole team is awesome. But he says if you um, petal proof or sprayed on the back of the tulips and other delicate flowers, it allows them to open, open the petals slower and the flower will last longer for you. 
which will be great. And if you if you keep a couple of, of leaves up at the top of the neck of the flower, that helps with the drawing up process too. You don't have to strip them bare, but a few couple leaves up is fine. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Shelly. And thanks for the tip, Brad. All right, guys. Our next question is from Cheryl. She wants to know, what do you recommend for the best shears to use daily? Or do you recommend using a knife? The good old shears versus knife debate. It's always a struggle with people. Um, there's always two camps of designers, people who like to use knives, people who like to use shears. Um, I will say a good designer uses the proper tool for the job. So most flowers need to be cut with knives. The, a sharp knife is gonna give you the cleanest cut. And for most cut flowers, you should learn how to use a knife. I feel most people, the reason they use shears is it's easy and they're afraid to cut themselves. So all cut flowers need to be used with a knife. And then branch, shears are for branches, bunches, things that need that good hearty cut. But really you need to learn how to use a knife and we need to, to probably demonstrate that sometime. But shears are always going to be, um, they're going to crush the vascular system of flowers. And this is why this is why a lot of old school florists get a little bristly when they see young people just always using shears all the time. It's because we we want to make sure the flowers are going to last the longest. And using also uh, using a knife is faster. You can keep that knife in your hand. You never have to put it on the table with shears. You constantly have to set it down, pick it up, set it down, pick it up. If you're use shear, I've used shears too without problem. But the it's better to use the right tool for the job, like I said, and make sure they're clean. We've talked about this before, right. keeping them sharp, keeping them clean. Most people cut themselves with dull tools, not sharp tools. So keep your keep your um, tools clean, sharp, and you won't have a problem. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Uh, our next question is from Linda. She wants to know, can the mix of flower food and water, which goes unused on a given day, be kept for future use? Is there a limit of days it can be set aside? What about quick dip? If stems are dipped into a small container with solution, but there is leftover solution, may this be safely saved for future use? Great question, Linda. Yeah, as far as the flower food goes, clean unused flower solution can be pre prepared and kept in your cooler for many weeks in advance. I would avoid using um, reusing dirty solution as bacteria may have begun to form that can clog stems or shorten flower life or there might be debris in it. Uh, the same would be true for the quick dips. You should plan on replacing the solution in your buckets and vases every couple of days also, if you're planning on holding them for an extended period of time. Uh, think of it as good hygiene for your flowers. You wouldn't reuse dirty bath water, right? So. <laughs> Now the the um the other thing that you can reuse though we're finding with the DE Express that particular product we use that here in our facility and that water can be reused it's a different kind it's not the same thing as the regular floral food like Cresol it's a high, super hydrating solution and that that particular product can actually be reactivated with tablets. So it's a good eco friendly option um, uh, for water. You don't have to keep dumping out the water. But Dave is absolutely right. You have to make sure that you're using clean product and clean containers and make sure that you're not reusing anything that obviously has bacteria or dirt in it. Yeah, good, good tips. And then a similar question came in from Carrie, but it's more about expiration date. She asks, do floral food or quick dip or floral cleaners expire? As given several bottles of quick dip, Gerber food, et cetera, from a shop that was going out of business. Some of the bottles are open, some are not. I can't find a printed expiration date on them. So I wondered if they're safe to use, especially the open bottles. Yeah, if in doubt, throw it out. <laughs> Open bottles of floral food and cleaning products with questionable vintage may start to oxidize over time, which will lessen the efficacy of the product. So you don't want to end up with something from the 1970s anyway. All right. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I'm going to try to find out from the rep on some of these products what their actual uh, life um, expectancy is and expiration dates on them so we can get a better idea of that to answer that question. Yeah. Good, 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 I good. Agree. Um, oh, I real quick going back to the shears versus knife thing. Hunter's Floral says, "Plus, we feel like a badass when we use a knife." <laughs> I like that. You go, girl. <laughs> Wait, I'll look at it. <laughs> uh, I love it. Good, good stuff. 
Um, and also Penny says uh, she works very fast with snips or shears, which is, yeah. I, I see a lot of people working fast with that. Friends, yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Uh, floral design questions. So our first floral design question is from Jessica. She says, I had a question for the podcast. want to pass it along. I would love to hear more about exercising restraint while covering the mechanics. As a newbie to floral design, it's something I struggle with. How do you find ways to make sure centerpieces don't look leggy while not jamming an expensive amount of flowers into the vase? Yeah, I think the problem is most floral designers spend the majority of their time time trying to cover the flower foam. So Oasis product, if you are if you have Oasis in a container, you're constantly trying to cover that up. Um, if you have a smaller mouth container, that'll help. Um, not using Oasis will help and using larger blooms that you can tuck down to cover the container also and then build around that. Anything you can do basically to cover the uh, opening or the space. So those are some of my suggestions. Um, it's really a good idea to try to find containers that you don't have to spend so much time. I mean, we were, when we were at the keto workshop, Sue McCleary, we were talking about that as well, you know, using chicken wire instead. Um, you, when she does her chicken wire um, burritos, as we, we said, yeah. it's, there's no oasis to cover and the mechanics are so light, there's not a lot to cover. Mm -hmm. So it's a really easy way to, uh, mechanics are hard and learning how to do proper mechanics will make you a, obviously a better designer. Um, you can also use moss and Gaelic leaves. If you use moss, make sure that you soak it and get it wet because moss is like a sponge and it'll wick out all the moisture of whatever you, you put it on. Those are some other things. Gaelic are a good cheat because they cover space easily. Um, but yeah, just don't overstuff with greenery. Just try to make sure the container you're using is not so big and out of proportion to what you're designing with that you have to cover it. It's really the way to look at it. Yeah, good stuff. Um, real quick, I wanna go back to uh, the question about expiration and unused things. So Jasmine says, does that apply to soaked foams as well? And I know the answer to that question, but if you guys wanna answer that, that's cool. Who wants to take it? So. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Soaked foam. Okay. So if you keep your flower foam in, and your most shops do this, they have a bucket with soaked foam in it. As long as that, that foam stays clean and no debris falls in it, because bacteria can grow on that, even though it has bact the bacteria inhibitors in it, bacteria can grow in, in the, in your oasis buckets can get dirty. I don't know if some of you may have noticed sometimes there's a slime in them. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you change and clean that as well. You cannot reuse uh, oasis that's dried out and re-soak it. And you shouldn't be using it anyway because it's it's gonna have old flower matter and bacteria in it if you've used it previously. Um, I think that's the question she's asking about. Right, so, right. Oh, yeah, but you don't wanna reuse it. Thank you, very good. All right, our next question comes from Jenny. Uh, she says, here are my questions regarding corsages and boutonnieres, which is good because May is coming up and we know there's going to be a whole lot of boutonniere and corsage making on top of the wedding season, right? So she wants to know, let's do the first question first and then we'll go down it. What are the best flowers to use for boutonnieres and corsages? Well, the usual suspects, the hardiest ones are going to be spray roses, roses, orchids, ranunculus, succulents. Um, hardy flowers that are dense, have a heavy petal count, are usually better. Things like freesia, fritillaria, um, things that are kind of hollow or tube-like tend to not do as well in corsages. They'll last a couple of hours. You can always make, if a bride is insistent on, say, a freesia a boutonniere for her groom, you can make a backup boutonniere because a lot of times now they're taking pictures really early. When you do those flowers, almost any flower can be used. It's how you properly store and hydrate them. So make sure they're hydrated to begin with. They can be soaked in water first. They can be sprayed and spritzed with uh, crowning glory, petal proof or anything that will help them. And then sealing them in a bag, a corsage bag or a box. You, there's a technique that a lot of the designers use that they layer paper, damp paper towels, put that in, seal it in a box and they'll hold up just fine. I've done that technique as well. It works really great. 
just it's just a matter of how you hydrate them and how well they are. And make sure your bloom is really fresh. Don't use anything ever that's wilting or questionable or looking like it might be on its way out. Great advice. Uh, her next question is, what are the newest techniques? Uh, rustic look with twine versus lots of tape and wire and magnets versus pins um, to create corsages and boutonnieres. And everyone that's watching, uh, share with us what you guys are doing, if there's something new or that you're doing or how you design. But Shelly, do, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, corsages have been around for so long, you'd think that the old school wired corsage would finally go out of fashion, but it's still popular. That wired corsage is always going to be a mainstay. Um, there's a whole lot of new techniques, though. There's all kinds of um, ways to do them. Again, I'll mention Sue again because she does yeah. some really great wearables. She uses all different kinds of techniques where she'll take a piece of leather, cut the shape out, glue all the flowers onto it. Um, you can make all kinds of pieces this way. You can use the Oasis Rustic Wire. It's a twisty wire, and you can just put things on that. You can just take a ribbon and do a single flower. These are more modern concepts. They're not so... Um, grandma-ish looking, um, and bracelets, jewelry. You can put flowers on almost anything with uh, cold glue. So you just, it's really an experimental thing. You can do whatever you want. If you're, y'all aren't familiar with Sue, I look at Passion Flower Sue on Instagram or Sue yeah. McClary. She's got a lot of really beautiful techniques that she does as well. So, but you can just get, you let your imagination grow, go wild with this. You can make them any way you want to. As long yeah. as the mechanics are sound. You know what I'm falling apart on you. Exactly. Um, and yeah. And Sue's amazing at all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So definitely check her out. I posted the link in the comments too, for you guys. Yeah. Passion flower Sue. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. The next question pertaining to corsages and boutonnieres are, um, can you keep it in floral foam and skip the plastic containers? I've never heard that. I'm not exactly sure I understood what they were asking on this. Um, is it because a corsage doesn't have a water source, so it's wired or taped or glued onto something. So I don't see how you could put it in floral foam. Now the flowers, if you mean prepping wise, cutting your heads and sticking them in oasis, wet oasis, yes, you can do that. I've done that before. If I had a large wedding, I would prep everything out, stick them in all an oasis. But because I stopped using Oasis as much a few years ago, I just let them lay in water and they're fine because you're going to shake them out, dry them, and then you'll use them. Uh, another question I think we missed was how early can you make them? And you can oh, do yeah. your corsages two to three days in advance, believe it or not, if you use the proper techniques of hydrating, like I talked about, storing them in the plastic or a plastic tub, um, especially if you're a big event company and you've got many weddings going on or even just your one event and you're trying to stay ahead of the game, you can safely do all personal flowers two to three days in advance, believe it or not. Experiment. If you don't think you can or you're worried about that, who's to stop you from just making a corsage on a Monday and storing it and seeing how long it lasts? You should be your own test subject. But they do hold up really well. Good, good. Um, and we have some conversation going on about corsages and boutonnieres. Uh, Huntress Floral says... Our clients love magnets versus pins and definitely more modern. So that's great to know. Um, but on the other end of it, Penny says, magnets don't always work for her. So I'm wondering if it's like maybe like a thicker type of it's a, Yeah, or... because if you make them too heavy, the magnets sometimes don't work. It depends depends really on the style of corsage and how you do it. But they they are pretty, pretty good. It just depends on, you can't make a bulky wire corsage, stick a magnet on it and expect mm -hmm. it to hold on someone. So yeah. you have to make a, it's a different technique. Maybe you're going to have to do the little piece of leather, glue some flowers on it, do the magnet on that, and you'll get a lighter um, corsage that'll hold up much better. But going back to also the longevity, I know a lot of people who worked <laughs> in flower shops can attest to this. We've all worked on proms, right? And some kid will always forget their corsage or boutonniere, and it will sit in the cooler for at least a week. And you'll pull that baby out and it's just as beautiful as the day you made it. So yeah, just Amazing. a little, uh, little note about that. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, and then Penny wants to know, do you charge more for glued corsages versus wired? Any thoughts there? That's up to you. I mean, it's a labor issue. So if you feel like it takes you more time, but you like the effect, then um, I would see how much time it takes you to make a glued corsage versus a wired. 
Personally, for me, I've always done wired corsages just because I'm old school and that's how I made them. I've done wired and glued combinations. I really um, never liked the cold glue because it got all over my fingers and that drove me nuts. But if you're doing it right and you do it, and if you get to a process or you can assembly line. Uh oh. We lost Shelly. Hold on, Shelly. I don't know what happened. Sorry, I this disappeared for a second. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, back. so but back to that. So it's just a labor issue, and you're the one that has to decide. And maybe it's not worth it for you to do them wired. Maybe you like glued, and vice versa. It's really your decision. Yep, exactly. And then uh, let's see. Anne says she switched to glue a few years back. It works great, and it really saves your hands. Especially if you have carpal tunnel, a lot of people can't do wired things because it, and I, I can attest to this, my arms, my hands start really aching after working on corsage and veneers for a few hours. So gluing is just a little piecemeal work and it's very light. So that, that is a good point. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good question with lots of comments. Hold on. We're still, we're still going here. One more. <laughs> um, oh, let me, let's see. RSGP floral design says, when you mentioned putting a piece of paper towel inside the corsage box to help with freshness. Do you mean a damp paper damp. towel or dry? Yeah, damp. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, not soaking wet, just damp. Okay, good, good. And then Penny says, uh, we made samples for the fridge, lasted about a week, just what you said, yeah. Shelly, too. So yeah, it's good. And there's a lot of fear about the flowers wilting, you know, so yeah. 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 I always get that question too with wired bouquets. People always ask me, how can an entire wired bouquet last? And I'm like, well, think about a corsage. It's mm -hmm. the same thing just on a grander scale. That's all yeah. we ever did in the 90s was wired, wired cascading bouquets and all that. So they do right. hold up really well. The 90s, love it. <laughs> um, and then one more proponent for glue. Lauren says, glue has changed my life. <laughs> yeah. I love it. All right. Good. We're going to move on, but I love, I love all these conversations. So keep it going guys. Uh, our next question is from Katrina. She says, how do you attach floral tape to rounded bases? I can't ever get it to stick. Is there another way to use a clear tape without gr tape grid? I don't. Okay, so you should be using Oasis, the Oasis green tape. The clear mm -hmm. tape does just not hold very well. You can use it, but make sure your vase is absolutely dry, cannot be wet at all, and it had not have any oil on it. If it came, sometimes I notice when they come packaged from overseas, there's this oily film on them. If you have to wash and dry your vases to get any film off of it and make sure that it's there's that the vase is completely dry. On a round vase or even a square cube or however you're doing it. If you'll put a, a rim of tape on first, instead of trying to stick the grid onto the vase, that'll give you something to adhere to. So round around the vase first with a light layer of tape. And then you don't, guys, you don't need like 20 million lines, just enough to support the grid. And then I'd go back around it as well. And that's a really easy technique. If you're worried about that tape showing, you can just take your knife and cut around the little tabs that kind of sort of hang out after you do that. If you're doing your mechanics properly and you're not having too large of a container, if you let your greenery flow over, you'll never see the tape. So yeah, uh, I prefer the green over the clear. Yeah, we've uh, at all our workshops, we never ever use clear. None of the designers ever ask for it. It just doesn't work. It's like, it's like, shiny scotch tape it's just yeah. <laughs> it's designed for clear vases but you really have to make sure your vase is dry and you do that little circle first but the green always works and the green is more waterproof it doesn't pop off either yeah yeah it's good good stuff um i have another audience question maybe Maybe we can hear from Dave too. I don't know. Uh, Cause you've been quiet here for a little bit, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Devin is, says, um, is there a leaf shine that doesn't kill you and everyone around you when you're spraying your greens? <laughs> I think when you spray something, I think we, what did we do? Yeah, unfortunately, most of the products we use have some form of chemicals in them. Um, I don't know of a natural one. Yeah. Like, you could make your own with a uh, olive oil water mix. It's basically an oil that's there, but you'd have to make sure you do it light and you have to wipe your leaves down. So 
That's the Anything. only option you have. The, there was a brand called Pocon out of Holland that was really good for years. I don't know if they're, they're still around. I like that brand, but um, you have to just take them outside, dust them down, spray them a little bit with a little fine mist of water, wipe them and call it a day. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, like, if you're using a, any kind of spray, I'd probably just take it outside. That's probably take it in the butt, but um, I'm really uh, sensitive to smells and things like that, too. And my, like, lymph nodes explode when there's things in the air. So I would have to go outside and probably wear a mask and all that fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> me and my nerdy ways. Um, all right. Our next question is from Courtney and she says, I'm curious on what a few different ways are to make flower walls with one being easy to repurpose to take to the reception area. Um, there's so many ways to make flower walls. It's dependent on um, the area you're in. Are you building your own structure to do the flower wall? Do you have to install it there? A lot of florists do their own wall. It's a plywood, plywood board wall that's on casters or wheels. So that's the only way you can move it from one way to the one room to the other. Um, you um, oh, there's all the floral company, all the oh, foam companies make special sheets of oasis that attach to flower walls are thin. They're like a big block or rectangle, rectangle. Sorry, you can't get my phone. Um, if you can hear, if you can um, attach those to the wall, just keep in mind soaked oasis is extremely heavy. Yeah. Um, not again, my favorite thing to do. What I love is chicken wire. You just tack it all over a um, plywood wall and you can do like again, Sue's burrito method, or you can do any chicken wire and you can just pop the flowers in. You can also buy grids at the dollar store. They're little metal grids. You can use those to put flowers in. The flowers just essentially have to hang in it. If you need them to be wa a water source, you can water too. But most of those hardier flowers like orchids and roses and all those things will hold up fairly well without it. The, you can also do a combination of silk with fresh. So you can make a, a base that's and I've done this before with clients where we've done the base of the backboard's moss. We've hung silk greenery on it, some silk roses, and then filled the whole entire thing in with fresh flowers. You cannot tell the difference in a evening wedding reception. Most, most of the time, silk flowers, you can't even tell they're being used. They're good quality. Um, what else? I think that's good. Chicken wire is always our friend when it comes to doing lighter weight um, installation pieces. Because like, like I said, Oasis is heavy. Yeah. You have, to, you have to literally screw that to the wall. Yeah. we Do you guys remember when we did the whole flower wall contest at all of our branches? And everyone <laughs> was like, oh, my God, these things weigh so much. And it was, it was quite the process for everyone. Yeah. Good learning team building activity. <laughs> <laughs> all for good cause, though, because we were raising money. They were, like, doing a contest to raise money for their charity. So it was pretty cool. They are heavy, though. Yeah, very heavy. Uh, let's see. I love comments. So Lynn says, yes, on silk, up high with fresh added. She does that as well. Um, oh, and back to the, the, the question about spraying. Um, where did the words that spray? I can't even, I can't even find the question now. Oh, but uh, Lori says green glow has improved her complexion. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's very cute, Lori. We're all going to be going by yeah, green glow. You buy some, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe like I won't get that one guy that always pops up right there. Um and then uh, Lori, let's see, Penny says uh, green glow too. She's, she votes for green, green glow. So here we go. So maybe try that out. All right. Um, let me see. What is the next question? I lost my, my place here. I think it's from Lori. Yes, Lori. She wants to know what's the best way to design a beautiful cascade bouquet? Wedding theme, romantic, lots of blushes and whites. Uh, spray roses, ranunculus, garden roses, or peonies, et cetera. So this question I think is twofold. Are you asking what's the best kinds of flowers for a cascade or are you asking the mechanics um, designing a cascade? And uh, when you say cascade, do you mean classic teardrop waterfall shape? 
or a cascading arm bouquet. So there's different ways cascade can be interpreted. There's different ways you can do it. Like I was talking about earlier, I cut my teeth on completely all wired bouquets and that's doable and still a, a very beautiful way to design a bouquet because you have a lot of control on it. Um, you can do it partially hand tied and then do partially wired. So the top part's hand tied. You can make a wired tail and it can be attached. You can use Holly Chapel's egg that she does inside mm -hmm. of a hand tied bouquet to get a really dramatic sort of taco shaped cascade. There's many different ways to do it. And all flowers can be used for cascades. There's not really anything besides maybe sticky uppy flowers like gladiolas or liatris or things that are too, have too hard of a line. Um, most people don't ask for those things anyway, but you can however use gladiola blooms. They make a very lovely flower if you, uh, bloom. If, you, if you've ever tried that, you can cut them down through the laterals and then they're really pretty if you wire those. Um, but they can be made all different kinds of ways. The most, most current trendy look probably right now is garden and romantic and soft and not too structured. So while a classic teardrop is going to be really tight, um, uh, you want to do something that's looser, more flowing and hand tied. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, good stuff. And then this reminds me that like one of our first bouquet videos that we did was with Mandy Majerik and mm -hmm. she did a really pretty cascade, like more modern type of bouquet. So I posted the link for that. So you guys can check it out. Yeah. Um, it was back in April of 2012, and it has over 200,000 views. So it's um, oh great, yeah. and also chicken wire too. Don't be afraid to use it in the bouquet either. So yeah. if you want to make a hand tied and work a piece of chicken wire down to do your cascade, <laughs> girls, guys, it you can mold it and fold it and stick those flowers right in. So don't be afraid. Experiment. Yeah. I would always say, guys. Don't wait until the wedding week to try something if you've not done yeah. it before. Go and get some old flowers or some, you know, past their prime flowers and play with them and experiment while you're not working on a wedding where you don't have the stress on you and just see what works for you. It's just a great way to, to educate yourself and learn and be better at your craft. I think a lot of us are so busy all the time. We go from one wedding to the next and we never have time to actually teach ourselves. So make sure you just try with any old flowers you have laying, laying around in the shop. That's always a great way to, to utilize um, that product. Yeah. I, I think it's fun. And it, and also it would take away like the stress of the day of like while you're doing absolutely. that. Design. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't like to wait to the last minute to learn how to do something for the very <laughs> first time when it's due, you know, you got to yeah, play around so that way you're comfortable and it just takes a lot of stress out of your life. All right, our next question is from Rebecca and she wants to know, is it possible to have a successful business that doesn't specialize in big events and weddings? Primarily small events, dinner parties, holidays, celebration bouquets, etc. cetera. Uh, she says she's looking to open up a shop and while I know large event and wedding design is lucrative. I prefer to keep my client base focused on smaller events and personal flowers. Is that sustainable any large market? Apparently she lives in one of the four major US cities. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, there's a larger market for smaller weddings and there are for larger weddings. So if that's what you wanna do, completely go for it. Um, there's many, many people who specialize in just doing petite, small events and weddings. And quite honestly, that's the majority of the client you're going to get anyway. There's very few people that really can get to that large upper echelon event business. And the people that can't afford to do that, they still need flowers and they still need people to do that. I mean, I know we talk a lot about having a big event business and how to get there and all that, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with just a good bread and butter. And that's a sustainable business and there's a market for it for sure. So don't feel pressure to do anything. You are in the driver's seat of your business. You decide what works for you. You'll be fine. Yeah. It's awesome. Great questions, guys. We are. And I love it. Good stuff. I'm just looking through the comments to see what else is going on. Uh, Penny <laughs> says, going back to the corsages again, gladi talking about gladiolas uh, or gladi. Gladiolas. Gladiolas. Yeah, I said it right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So those blooms make fabulous corsages. 
That's good. And good. a lot of people have, you can remember we used to make what's called a glamelia out of gladiola blooms. And so it would be this constructed entirely wired and glued flower that was fabulous. And that was a thing once. And I don't get a lot of requests for that anymore, but it is a thing. <laughs> so what pretty, look it, it up. What is it glamelia. called? Glamelia. So it's a camellia flower made out of gladiola bloom. So it's called oh, a glamelia. <laughs> very cool. It's a composite flower, like a composite rose, but with yeah. gladiola blooms. So pretty. Very fun. Um, and if you're curious about composite flowers too, we have a, Mandy Majerk did a video about that too. And back in 2012, crazy. It's crazy how far we've come. Um, let's see. I have a question here from Jasmine. She says, I'm running into brittle heads on lilies, especially the buds. Is that typical? They snap off at the slightest touch. Well, lilies can break if you breathe on them. So what variety? Is it a Casablanca or Asiatic lilies? I Is, know. Uh, she's saying sure. what kind? No, she didn't. Jasmine I'd have here. to know what, which kind. What do you think, Dave? Have you yeah, had any issues? varieties yet? are really fragile as far as blooms popping off or like the next cracking. Um, I don't know. I would just try a different variety. Yeah. Some of which, yeah, which kind of lily you're talking about? Because right. a lot of lilies are very, once you get a lily open, they're very delicate. So make sure you're not crowding them in the vase. Give them op space to open up. Remember I was talking about flowers that move or sit still. Lilies are a mover. So they'll open up over time and they need that space to open up. Make sure they're not tangled. You're not trying to pull them apart. Um, I have noticed sometimes there's certain Asiatics where their buds will drop off. I don't know why that happens. I'll try to find out, but that could be, they got too cold maybe right. or a shipping issue, but I've never seen them just be like completely brittle and fall off. I'm, I haven't, I haven't experienced that, but it could be the type, type of Lily. So. Yeah. Jasmine says it was with her Asiatic lilies. Yeah. As Asiatics. I have noticed sometimes if they're either underdeveloped or I, I don't know why that happens. It's a, periodically that happens, but um, they should show an Asiatic should be nice. And when you get it, it should have color on it, not too green. Sometimes if they're coming in too green, they might've been cut too soon, but they should have a little color in the bud and then they should open up fine, but make sure you're not crowding them. Make sure you properly process them. When they, when you get them, get them out of the sleeve, take the foliage off. I'm always three quarter, one quarter. So three quarters foliage off one quarter at the top and make sure you've got a lot of room around them so that they can open up in, in their environment. And you may have to leave them out of the cooler because they, they, if you say you have lilies and you leave them in the cooler too long, they're never going to open in the cooler. And if they're, if you're storing them for a week or two like that in the cooler, they may never open. So, if you need them for design work, bring them out, let them open, get them to the stage you want, and then put them back in the cooler. All right. Good. Uh, I found a couple more questions from the beginning of the show. So let me go through those real quick. Uh, this one is from John. He says, great show. Where do I find woven cord wire for corsages? Do you guys know? Uh, our, our local San Diego wholesale supply carries them. Um, syndicate sales. I'm sure most of the floral supply places. You could probably try to look online as well. I don't know if you know any other sources, Dave, but that's usually where we're finding it. Yeah, you're mentioned in the same sources we have. Try your local uh, hard good supplier. Yeah, and I know Mayish carries hard goods at a few of theirs of their locations, but not all of ours. We we focus primarily on the fresh flowers. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a special one that's made by Oasis, and it's a rustic kind of cording that they use to do the corsages. Yeah, yeah. So you can always check with Oasis, too, and see who their suppliers are in your area. I'm sure they have a, a source for that, too. Good question, John. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I have a question from Penny. She says, a question when the time comes. <laughs> I see stock photos being used to advertise. I don't use them. I show actual shop work. How do you feel about using stock photos? I always have an opinion on that, but I don't know if you guys do. I can go last. <laughs> I'm not a fan, but I think you should always showcase your work. I think a lot of the time stock photos show a florist that's not real invested in their image or their, their brand. 
And a lot of times those are from FTD or Teleflor or some wire service has given them that or given them a website. Um, nothing wrong with it if that's the look you do and you're very, very, right you know, bread and butter shop and you like to do, you know, classic traditional designs and you just need clean, easy images. And it's really just, just the style of your shop. That's my opinion. Um, I, I always prefer to see the florist work, the real work though. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I just think um, when you're a business, there's certain things that you need to invest in. And one of them is just some sort of photography, even if it's just one type of shoot, um, or you know, even if you can set it up on your own and it's like just very good lighting. And there's amazing things that you can do with apps and, and different things like that nowadays. Um, but just investing in that photography for your business, I think it's really, really important, especially when you're advertising. Um, and, and like if it's in a professional setting, you know, I just think it needs to make sure that it's matching that. So, you know, for example, an ad that we would put in Flutter Magazine might look different than the ad that we're gonna do in Florist Review. And Flutter Magazine, we actually like went through and made sure because everything's very curated and everything's very cohesive. So we wanted to make sure that it was like the luxury, high end look and feel and it matched with that. And so like using a stock photo isn't going to work <laughs> to do something like right. that typically. So um, there is some good stock photography out there. Don't get me wrong. And there's actually, I think it's called creative market um, that like has a lot of really cool vendors on there that can do things. So, you know, again, if you're, if you don't have the expertise and stuff like that, it might be a good way right. to kind of get started, but definitely I would invest in something that, you know, you can be proud of and say, this is mine. Um, and it really reflects your business and you can control all the details in the image that you're using. Agreed. Good stuff, guys. Um, let's see. I think that's it for now. This is a good show, though, guys. Thank you so much. Dave, Shelley, you have anything that you wanted to share before I let you go? Uh, no, just to say we're going to I'm going to be sad that Dave's not going to be with us all the time, but he'll hopefully do some guest shots. And I'm going to do my best to pop in and <laughs> surprise you guys once in a while, I promise. And best <laughs> wishes and good luck in Seattle. You're going to be you so, so happy, much. I know. Yeah. Home, so. yeah, I'm going home, so I, I feel really good about it. And happy Easter, everybody. I know. Happy, happy Easter. Easter. <laughs> Shelly and I, and I like oranges and colors. And I love that we all coordinated. That was a I know. serendipitous thing, huh? Get orange get orange and I know, right? <laughs> 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 little so cute. <laughs> and so, I got my man shirt on. My man shirt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yes. Happy Easter. Good luck, Dave. And um, I will see you guys yeah. later. Take All care. Right. Bye. 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 <laughs> All right, guys. That's a wrap on our show. Thank you so much for joining us live or listening to the replay or listening to the podcast. We really, really appreciate your support. I hope that you guys all share this show with your flower friends if you don't mind. And if you think of any questions, be sure to email them over. You can email them to marketing at mayish.com um, or reply to one of our emails that I've sent you guys or send them through our website. I would really appreciate it. We're going to gear up for our next show, which as a reminder is May 21st. So be sure you mark that on our calendar. Calendar. And with that, that's a wrap, guys. Again, thank you for joining us. Keep on sending in your flower questions. And I hope you have an amazing day. See you soon. Bye, everyone.